Good morning, church, and praise the Lord. It is yet another day that we will rejoice in the presence of God as we fellowship together this morning. My name is Pastor Grace Minor, and I'm glad to be the service host today. And karibuni, karibuni sana. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Abba Father, we bow before you this morning, Lord, to acknowledge that you are God, to acknowledge that you reign forevermore, and there is no God like you, Jehovah God. We thank you for this service. As we begin, Lord, we invite your presence, Lord, to be with us, Jehovah God, that even as we lift our praises to you, that, Lord, you will be honored and we, you will be glorified. Lord, we pray, like David, that how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart, my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar, O Lord Almighty, my King and my God. We desire to experience your presence today. We desire to hear your word today. We desire to be encouraged today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome to our Sunday service. If you're a visitor and visiting us on this platform for the very first time. We'll be more than glad to acknowledge as you comment on the chat section. So kindly let us know where you are and listening us from or watching us from. And if you're a visitor, please feel very welcomed at Nairobi Chapel Langata service. And it will be a joy to have you even view our other services as we move along. I hope you're ready to worship God this morning. And I pray that you have your Bible, your notebook, just get them ready. If there's a family member or a friend in your house who is still moving around, just tell them, hey, it's church. Come, let's do church here at home. As we start our service today, allow me to read another Psalm 73 from verse 25 to 28, this time using the message version. And it says, you are all I want in heaven. You are all I want on earth. When my skin sags and my bones get brittle, God is rock firm and faithful. Look, those who left you are falling apart. But I mean, look, those who left you are falling apart. Deserters, they will never be heard from again. But I'm in the very presence of God. Oh, how refreshing it is. I've made Lord God my home. God, I'm telling the whole world what you do. And I pray that each one of us, this time as we get to a time of worship, that we'll be able to let loose and just praise the Lord, praise the living God, because he is worthy of our praise and he's worthy of our worship. So I will welcome Pastor Mani and Pastor Brenda to lead us in a time of worshiping the Lord this morning. Be blessed.
calling of heaven, crucified. Worthy is the
victory belongs to Him. Oh, 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 victory belongs to Jesus. Victory belongs to Him. But who can stand? Who can stand against the Lord? No one can. Against the king, no one can, no one will. Who can stand against our Lord? Who can stand against the Lord? No one can, no one will. Who can stand against the king? Who can stand against the king? No one can, no one will. Oh, 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 victory belongs to Jesus. Victory belongs to Him. Oh, 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 victory belongs to Jesus.
There is none like you, Lord. High and lifted up. High above everything, Lord. For you are King of Kings. You are Lord of Lords, the beginning and the end. You're everything we need. Oh, that's how we say. Jesus, victory belongs to me. Oh, 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 victory belongs to Jesus. Victory belongs to me. We worship you. You are worthy, worthy of our praise, O God. You are the beginning and the end. Father, you are worthy of worship today. We give you praise, O Lord. We magnify your holy name. We exalt you because you reign supreme. You are sovereign in all your ways. There is no God like you. You are the Lord of lords and the King of kings, Jehovah God. You are compared to no one, O God. 
you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And Father, we just worship you this morning. We declare that you reign on high, O oh God. There is no one that is compared to you, Jehovah God. This morning, as we worship you in, our, in the comforts of our homes, my Father, we declare that you are God, that you are at the center of our hearts, O oh God. You are at the center of our homes, my Father. And you deserve all the praise, and you deserve all the honor, and you deserve all the worship, O oh God. How we are anticipating, Jehovah God, even to experience your presence in our lives today, O oh God. Father, may you reveal yourself, Lord, in our homes, Father, even as we partic participate in this service, Jehovah God, as we get to hear your word, dear God, I pray that you would reveal yourself, O oh God. Thank you for the week that has been, O oh God. Thank you that you have kept us. You have watched over us. You have been our protector and our shield, our strong tower, our salvation, O oh God. Thank you for the week that is coming ahead. We surrender it to you, O oh God. And we ask that, Father, you would take charge over it, O oh God. We pray that indeed you will be our Alpha. That you will be our Omega, O oh God. Because without you, we are nothing, Jehovah God. Father, we know that you will not lead us to territories that you have not conquered. And therefore, Lord, we lay our lives before you. We surrender to you, O oh God. And we ask that you would have your way, O oh God. We trust you because you never fail. We trust you because you're dependable, O oh God. And we pray, Jehovah God, just thanking you for all that you have done for us. We cannot tell it all because you have done so much in our lives. And we rejoice in all that you do and all that you're going to do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. This time we'll be ready. Please be ready with your Bible and notebook as we continue with the book of Revelation. And we'll be having Pastor Brenda coming to share with us the truths that are in Revelation chapter 2. So dive in, ensure that you're ready to hear God's word and let it transform you. I invite Pastor Brenda now to come and share God's word and may the Lord's anointing be upon you. Amen. Good morning, church. Uh, it's so, so good to be coming to you um, through this camera. <laughs> How I wish I was seeing each and every one of you, but God be the glory. Thank you so much, Pastor Grace, for how you have so ably led us through service. Such an honor to be serving with you. God bless you. Now, church, we have been going through the book of Revelation. And I say we have been going through as so though it's been a long period, but we actually just started last Sunday. So worry not if you're watching us today for the very first time or you're joining us in fellowship today for the first time in this series. This is just the second Sunday into the series of the study of the book of Revelation. Now, last week, Pastor Titus took us through chapter one excellently. Thank you so much, Pasi. We have some background into this book, and I'm looking forward to more teaching from him and Pastor Joseph and all the other pastors will be taking us through. So I pray that you also are as eager as I am to hear from the Lord, to hear what he has to say through the book of Revelation. Please allow me to pray even as we begin. King of glory, thank you so much for this opportunity to gather in this way as a church. Definitely not the norm, but we are grateful that we get to fellowship nonetheless, even virtually. Father, we know that your word is powerful. It is sharper than a double-edged sword. It goes through marrow and bone, meaning, God, it cuts deep. And we pray that even as we listen, deep calls to deep. Father, Lord, would you go deep into our hearts, Lord? Would you um, just sow this word so ably and so deeply in us, God? May it bear much fruit because of the understanding that comes out of it and the wisdom that comes out of it and the transformation, oh God, that comes from listening to your word. Father, we pray that we'll not just be listeners, but doers of your word. Whatever you challenge us to do through this book today, through the chapter we're going to go through today, we pray that God, you would enable us, Holy Spirit, to act according to your will. After all, it is the Spirit speaking to us. It is the Spirit speaking to the churches, as we will see. 
and you have asked us to hear and to act accordingly, God. Enable us, O oh Holy Spirit, to do that which is, which is your desire for us. We thank you once more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love backstories. And I know there are people who, even in conversations, are like, I don't do backstories. But, you know, backstories give us understanding. They give us context. They give us also insight into the present and even the future. And so, as much as we did go through the background of this book last Sunday, I know that those of us who may not have watched it yet, and you haven't watched, if you haven't watched that, that video or that sermon, I encourage you to do so. It will inform a lot of what we're going to discuss moving forward. Having said that, a little background. The book of Revelation is rich in context. It's rich in history because quite a lot of it actually comes from the Old Testament. I want you to have in mind that the Christians of this day that this book was written had the Old Testament only. We are privileged to have the Old and the New Testament, but they had the Old Testament only. And also, I need you to have in mind that these Christians knew their word by heart. They did not have the book that we have today. And having said that, I hope you have your Bible in your notebook. And if you have a reference Bible, fantastic, or a study Bible, fantastic, to really help you during this study. But they did not have this like you and I have. Nonetheless, let me just get into the background of the book of Revelation. Now, the book of Revelation was written by Apostle John approximately AD 95 on the island of Patmos. The purpose of this book is to reveal the full identity of Christ and to give warning and hope to believers. As Revelation chapter 1 verse 1 and 2 tells us, it is the revelation from Jesus which God gave him, Jesus, to show his servants and the events that must soon take place. It is a report of John who received this message from Jesus of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. It is a report. Revelation is a report from John of what he had revealed, or rather what was revealed to him by Jesus Christ about the word of God and who Jesus really is. Now the audience, the original audience, was the seven churches in Asia Minor, which is present-day Turkey. It was not just for the seven churches, but even for the believers who were in existence at that particular time, even those who were not necessarily uh, amongst the seven churches as mentioned earlier. It is important to note that the number seven is used several in the book of Revelation. And this is because the number seven in Hebrew represents perfection and completeness. So in a sense, even as these seven churches are the ones being addressed or were the ones being addressed in history at that particular point in time, Jesus is addressing the church across history, the church today in the church that will be in existence at his return. It is believed that these seven churches to whom John was writing were experiencing great persecution under the emperor Domitian. Domitian had come after Nero, and it must be noted that even when Nero was emperor, things were actually thicker, they were worse. He really took the Christians through a lot of suffering, and he made a mockery of the faith. Domitian ruled between AD 90 to 95. Now John, the apostle, their pastor, was not exempt from the suffering that the Christians went, to, went through. And perhaps this was enriching for his own experience and even in writing this book. It is said that before they exiled him to Patmos, where he was writing this book, they had tried to kill him by dip dipping him in hot oil. And it is a miracle that he did not die. At this time, John was the only surviving apostle. The rest had been martyred, with the exception of Judas, who took his own life. Perhaps Domitian thought that killing the only surviving leader of the Christian movement would actually put an end to Christianity. But he was very wrong. Revelation is written in apocalyptic form. Apocalyptic meaning uncovered, unveiled, or revealed. Now this is a form of Jewish literature that uses symbolic imagery to communicate. In this case, John used this style to communicate hope to the Christians in the midst of their suffering and persecution. It makes sense why he would do so. 
these people were going through hell on earth, but he indeed helped them see vividly that their hope in Jesus was not in vain, and surely that a reward was awaiting them in days to come. John uses imagery to show that Christ is indeed the glorious and victorious Lord of all. The all-powerful king, victorious in battle, glorious in peace, not just the humble earthly teacher, but also the glorious God. This imagery that John uses is not meaningless or senseless or from the clouds. It has meaning, it has roots, a lot of which can be found in the Old Testament. In fact, it is said that there are about 518 illustrations in Revelation that can be traced back to the Old Testament. I mentioned earlier that these Christians knew their word by heart. They had no choice. They did not have the privilege of having multiple versions or sizes of the Bible. They had to know it by heart. And John knew his Bible very, very well. And because he knew his people also knew their word, then he used, used the imagery that is there in the Old Testament to communicate to his flock. Some scholars believe that he used imagery and illustrations also as a way to waylay the Romans who were persecuting them. In case they came across the material, the Christians would not be liable for anything because they would not understand a thing they would read, and I'm referring to the Romans. It was coded language. What he, he was communicating was very sensitive because it described the judgment, the coming judgment, and the end of all human kingdoms, and the soon coming establishment of the kingdom of God. This was definitely not news that needed to land in the hands of Romans in a way that they would understand. Now, the book of Revelation carried in it a message that the Christians then really needed to hear, really needed to grasp, and really needed to believe. They needed to believe that in the midst of their suffering and the persecution, in the midst of the deaths of even their leaders, that Jesus was still on the throne, all-powerful, still in control, and that he was coming back soon with rewards for all of them who would endure to the very end. This message, fellow Christians today, is also a message that we too need to grasp and believe. Just like the Christians then, who were under the Roman Empire, needed to resist the influence of their oppressors because they could have easily compromised just to have peace and to save their lives. But just like they fought those influences then, we too must resist the, our current influences of the human kingdoms that exist today. We must not compromise what we know is right because of the pressure that comes and the suffering that comes with standing by it. So in a nutshell, the book of Revelation is not just a book with prophetic information, which it does. It is also a book that gives us a personal revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now having said that, having given us that little backstory, I want us to dive into the second chapter of the book in which Jesus speaks to the seven churches. Now this message to the seven churches, as written by John, was addressed to these particular churches. That is the church in Ephesus, in Smyrna, in Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Now John was the overseer or the pastor of those seven churches. I want us to examine what the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to the Ephesian church. As I mentioned earlier, the number seven in Hebrew marks completion and perfection. These ch seven churches give us a complete picture of how the churches were, how the church would be thereafter, until the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The church today can relate with these seven churches in one way or the other. As Jesus is addressing these seven churches, there's a certain flow that emerges. It seems as though he begins by affirming the church, speaking about the good things and the good aspects of that particular church, with the exception of just one church that we'll see as we do our future studies. And then he corrects the church. He rebukes whatever is not right in the church. 
again with the exception of one as we will see in the future and then he closes by motivating them by speaking of the reward awaiting them if they receive his message and comply with it just like these seven churches each church brings out an aspect of Christ it begins by affirming what is Christ like in them today some churches are great in evangelism others in mercy works others in teaching and so on and so forth and just like those churches then the church today each reflects an aspect of Christ and together we create a holistic picture of who Jesus is how amazing is that you know sometimes i hear in our conversations we compare oh this church is great in evangelism why shouldn't why perhaps they should just pick up on their teaching ministry and become better in teaching oh this church is awesome in worship maybe they need to do a little bit of evangelism oh this church is great at church planting i think this is a challenge for us today to realize that each of us each congregation is unique in one way or the other and portrays christ in one way or the other So instead of comparing we should complement one another. If this church is great in evangelism, maybe we can learn a thing or two from the church that is great in worship or partner better yet because after all we are one body and our mission is just one to establish the kingdom of God here on earth or to work towards the establishment of the kingdom of God here on earth telling people of the good news of Jesus Christ in every way as we may be empowered by the holy spirit so let's have this in mind that just like the churches then the church today the congregations today each reflect an aspect of Christ and together we create a holistic picture of who Jesus is i would like us now to go through the book of revelation from chapter 2 and we will begin from verse 1 and go all the way to verse 7 the message to the church in ephesus i will be reading from the new living translation feel free to use whichever version you have with you write this letter to the angel of the church in ephesus this is a message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand the one who walks among the gold lampstands I know all the things that you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look at how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. But this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans, just as I do. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious i will give the fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of god blessed be the word of the lord now in verse 1 and i hope that you keep your bible open because we'll keep referring to the text in verse 1 we see that this letter is written to the angel of the church in ephesus Now the word angel here is referring to the messenger or to the elder or the pastor of the church in Ephesus. Some scholars believe that it is actually referring to a guardian angel. Most however believe that the word angel is referring to the messenger or the pastor of the church because chapters 2 and 3 actually hold reprimands that would not apply to angels or heavenly beings. You must remember that angels are there only to the will of God. they have no capacity to sin they are there only to the will of god or they have no capacity to fall short we see that if at all it was referring to an angel then chapters 2 and 3 would be irrelevant but we see that people are corrected it is individuals who are being corrected in chapters 2 and 3 the one who holds the seven stars is jesus and we see that still in verse 1 
Because it says this message, this is a message from the one who holds the seven stars in his hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. He is also the one who walks among the seven gold stars. So he's the one holding the stars and the one walking among the gold lampstands. The seven stars are the leaders of those seven churches, whereas the seven gold lampstands are the seven churches themselves. This is indic indicative indicative sorry of jesus power and authority over the churches and their leaders now having said that i know i keep saying that phrase a lot i'm sorry about that i want us to get into the background of ephesus i, get, I love backstories man they just give context they give understanding insight to the present and to the future ephesus was the capital of asia minor and I said that Asia Minor is present-day Turkey, a center of land and sea trade, and one of the most influential cities in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. The Temple of Artemis, one of the ancient wonders of the world, was in this city. It was also a leading producer of the images of this goddess. Now, Paul planted this church many years before John writing this letter and ministered there for three years. During his time with them, he warned them that false teachers would come and try to draw people away from the faith. False teachers did indeed cause problems in the Ephesian church, but the church resisted them, as we see in the letter to the Ephesians. John spent much of his ministry in this city as well and knew that they had resisted false teaching. And so it takes us to verse 2. I know all the things that you do. I've seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You have discovered they are liars and so on and so forth. But there was a downside to this church. As much as they had resisted, and again, even before I go to the, back, the downside, we must commend them for being steadfast and resisting the influences of their time because this city was known for immoral sexual practices and the worship that was associated with the goddess Artemis. But this did not cause them to water down or to allow practices that were not in accordance to what they had been taught with Paul, by Paul that is in God's word. Now in verse 3, after Christ has commended them uh, for being hardworking, for being patient and enduring the suffering, for not tolerating evil people, and critically examining the claims of false apostles without, without, without quitting, there's something that he holds against them. Verse 3, he says, and I just ask us to go back there. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. But, verse 4, I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. All these efforts they had made, all this hard work, all this endurance, All this examination of false prophets and knowing them and setting them aside and chasing them from the church. All this suffering without quitting, unfortunately, was not motivated by the love that they had for God. It did not spring out of love and this grieved Jesus. We must remember that both Jesus and John stressed love for one another as an authentic proof of the good news. In their effort to maintain sound doctrine, in the effort, the Ephesian church, in their effort to maintain sound doctrine and moral and doctrinal purity, they lost their love for God. Perhaps the conflict they were going through and the length for which it had endured was making them weak or had made them weak and destroyed their affection. And perhaps this is what led to their situation currently as we see in scripture. It's interesting though that Paul had once commended this church for its love for God and others as seen in Ephesians 1, 15. But many of the church founders who existed then were no longer there. By this time, 
many or even the second generation believers had lost their lives. This church had become a very busy church, doing so much to benefit themselves and the community around them, but they were not acting out of love. Please let us remember that work for God must be motivated by love for God. Otherwise, it will not last. Work for God must be motivated by love for God, or else it will not last. In verse 4, Jesus complains that they do not love him or each other like they did at first. You know, I'm, I'm reminded of this, I don't know, scenes in the movies when people fall in love, a man and a woman fall in love so much, and they're so into each other. And I, I can't help but visualize this even in relation to this scripture. That just like that first love, New believers have this way of rejoicing at their newfound forgiveness and their newfound relationship with Jesus. This new life, this new nature that they get as a result of committing their lives to Christ. But then, as time progresses, and perhaps this is also what happened to this church, the new believer may lose sight of the seriousness of sin of what Jesus has done for them, of the power within which they live, of the new creature that they are, that they begin to lose the thrill and the love and the passion for God, for Jesus. This is what happened to this church. In the beginning, they perhaps had enthusiasm without knowledge. But at this time, because again, Paul had spent quite some time with them, teaching them and empowering them, giving them the necessary knowledge to outlast him. Perhaps at this time, they had the knowledge but without enthusiasm. And this happens to us as well. We know so much of the things of God. It becomes so much of, of head knowledge. And in the process, we may lose our love. Both are necessary. It is important for us to know the truth, to know what has been done for us, to know God's word. It is important for us to understand the things of God, to acquire wisdom and understanding. It is important. But it is also necessary to stay fervent and passionate and to love God. Both are necessary if we are to keep love for God intense and untarnished. Let me ask you today, are you as passionate for God? Are you as full of love for God as you did when you first received him? And maybe you're not born again and you're wondering, what is this all about? You too can experience this relationship with Jesus. You too can experience this love and this freedom and this salvation. And the Holy Spirit is at work in your heart. If you would embrace and accept that you are indeed a sinner in need of a savior, then you would experience his love. And it is here now, ready for you to receive. And let me just take a detour and pray for somebody who's just feeling that conviction from the Holy Spirit. This desire for, a, for this first love that Christ is referring to. Let me pray for you today. And join me even as I make this prayer with you. Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. I have fallen short of your standards and I have fallen away from you and embraced myself and walked according to my desires, lived life according to my desires and those that are prescribed to me by the world. But today, knowing that I have done wrong in your eyes, I ask for your forgiveness. I ask that you would cleanse me. I ask that you would forgive me and make me a new creation. I receive you as Lord over my life. And I pray that you would help me know you more and be like you. That you would help me know you <laughs> and be like you. In Jesus' name. And if you prayed that prayer, drop us a comment and be sure to follow up with you. For those of us, I asked the question earlier. 
for those of us who are born again, I asked the question earlier. Do you love God with the same fervor as when you were a new Christian? Even as you think upon that, and as the Holy Spirit convicts you concerning that. I want us to move on to verse 5, where he commends the Ephesian church, or rather where he commands the Ephesian church to retrospect and to turn back and to do what they did at first. And perhaps that's also the same, the same thing that we need to do, to retrospect. If we've, we don't have the same power we had when we began, to retrospect and ask ourselves, where did we fall off? When did our hearts began, begin to grow cold? When did our passion begin to waver? To retrospect and to turn back, to go back to doing those things that we were doing then, that kept the fire burning, that kept it alive. Because failure to do so, as we see in verse 5, would lead Jesus to remove the lamp from its stand, from its place. What does this really mean? What was Jesus saying to the Ephesians? What did he mean that he would remove their lampstand from its place? This meant that the church would cease to be an effective church. Failure for us to go back to our first love would lead us to grow cold and eventually to just sniff out. Just as a seven branch sorry, just as a seven branch candlestick in the temple gave light to the priest in the temple, the churches were to give light to their surrounding communities. But Jesus warned them that their lights would go out, specifically the Ephesian church. He warned them that the light would go out. In fact, Jesus himself would extinguish any light that did not fulfill its purpose. The church needed to repent of its sin. And this is true of us today. In verse 6, however, he points out another thing that was good about these guys. They hated the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans just like Jesus did. Now, who are the Nicolaitans? These were believers who compromised their faith in order to enjoy some of the sinful practices of the Ephesian society. The name Nicolaitans is believed by some to be roughly the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew term Balaamites. Balaam was a prophet who had induced and influenced the Israelites to carry out their lustful desires. These Nicolaitans are also believed to have been religious leaders who wanted to be the end all, to be the final say, controlling every detail of the believers' lives, even as minute as who to marry, although that's quite a big deal, how to live, where to live, and so on and so forth. Do we have Nicolaitans in the church today? Do we have pastors, church leaders, elders, who would want to control every detail of their members' lives? Well, in this portion of scripture, we see that that ought not to be so, that Jesus does not approve of that and does not approve of such people. Jesus himself modeled something very different. He did not control people. He did not manipulate people. He gave them the freedom to choose him. He gave them the freedom to live. After all, Jesus said, I have come that you may live, that you may have life abundantly. It is my prayer that as, in, as NCLA, we have no Nicolaitans in our midst, even in the small groups. And that is on a light note. Verse 7, Jesus concludes with a call to them to listen and to act in accordance to what the Spirit was saying. He also speaks of the reward that would come as a result of repentance and true obedience. This reward was fruit from the tree of life. In Genesis, we are told about two trees, the tree of life and the tree that would give knowledge and understanding. Now, eating from the tree of life will bring eternal life with God. And that is what Jesus is promising these divisions. And this is what Jesus is promising us. He was promising them that if they endure the persecution, if they endure the hardship, they stayed faithful to him, but they stayed faithfully passionate, in love with him, 
they would enjoy life with him for all eternity. They would enjoy the freedom with him for all eternity. Eventually, evil will be destroyed and believers will be brought into a restored paradise. And that will happen in the new earth. Everyone will eat from the tree of life and live forever. And this is a promise that Jesus gave to the Ephesian church. So in conclusion, how much more would this address, this letter to the Ephesian church, or this message to the Ephesian church apply to us as Nairobi Chapel Langata? Are we as unwavering and as uncompromising as the Ephesian church, or have we, like the Nicolaitans, embraced some worldly practices and lowered our standards, embracing what we refer to as personal choices and alternative lifestyles? Have we embraced sin in the name of embracing sinners? We must remember that God's approval is infinitely more important than the world's. Let our standards be in line with God's word and not what the people around us are willing to accept. Where are we in our love and passion for God and his people? Are we faithful and passionate or faithfully passionless? Are we adhering to doctrines, amassing more knowledge, yet without love? Are we busy, yet without love, doing things and not out of love, but out of other motivation? Are we all in with God, or just going by, just getting by, and living in the bare minimum of our Christian faith? Are we at risk of being snuffed out, or is our light shining brightly for God's purposes? Are we willingly fulfilling God's purpose for our existence? Are we intentional about searching God's heart for us? And we must remember that the church is made of individuals. And so even though this was being written to a body, to a group of believers, each of us make the church. And we must ask ourselves these questions at a personal level. Because if I change, if I notice that there's an area of my life in line with the scripture that is not in alignment, and I change, then I get to shine brighter and influence the next person. And it goes on and so forth. And we shine for God's glory. And we live in God's purposes. And we fulfill God's purposes here on earth. If we are on track, hallelujah, the Lord Jesus Christ be praised. If we are failing in even one of these aspects, we must turn back. Just like Jesus told the Ephesian church. You need to go back. You need to retrospect. Go back to the place where you had a fallout or where you had a detour. We must repent. It's not just going back and retrospecting. We must make a decision to change and to realign ourselves with Jesus. To find that first love, to experience it once more and to live in it. We must repent and do the things that we did at first, when we were full of gratitude for the gift of salvation, when we were full of love for this God who has saved us. We must live and love Jesus. We must live for and love as Jesus has shown us in his word. And as a result, shine his light brightly in our homes, in our churches, in our society, in our workplaces, in our country, and the world. As we see in this address to the Ephesian church <laughs> and to the subsequent churches, it is clear that Jesus knows and cares for his church. The Lord of the universe knew each of these churches and its precise situation. In each letter, Jesus told John to write about specific people, places and events. He praised the believers for their successes, but also told them how to correct their failures. And just as Jesus cares for each of these churches, he cares for ours. 
He cares for Nairobi Chapel Langata. He wants us to reach our greatest potential. We are God's vehicle for changing the world. So let's take this vehicle seriously. Because God really does. And just like Jesus said in Revelation chapter 2 verse 7 Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the church. Listen and understand what the Lord is saying to you and what the Lord is saying to us as a church. God bless you. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Brenda. Wow. Going back to the first love. What was your take home? Just, just discuss with your family member or somebody you are with at home. Or text or chat or comment. Post in the group. Let's hear. What was your take home from today's study? Amazing. God is calling us back to the first love to the first love. He's calling us back to himself. Thank you so much, Pastor Brenda. May the Lord refresh you as you continue to prepare God's word. A lot that I share the order of services that we have here at Nairobi Chapel, Langata. We have our teen service that is aired on Saturdays at 6 p.m., both on Facebook Live and YouTube. We also have our children's service that is aired on Sundays at 9 a.m., and it's not very long, like half hour, they actually will have their service on Facebook Live and YouTube. They also have an online class at 11 a.m. Then we have this, the adult service, uh, which is on Sundays at 10 o'clock on Facebook and on YouTube. And then we have our midweek service, an amazing time to fellowship at the, in the middle of the week. You know, you've just done Sunday and you can't wait for another Sunday, so there's a midweek service. And we have it on Wednesdays from 7.30 on Zoom and on YouTube. And the handle is Nairobi Chapel Langata. I love that I say this benediction. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. May you have a lovely week. May the Lord go before you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord do you well. In Jesus' name, amen.